So today we're going to be talking about Star Citizen, something I said I wouldn't do on the channel just because of the level of uh, controversy it brings. But I figured this article would be one worth reading, and it's one that has got a different reaction depending on where you go on the internet. If you go on the Slash Games Reddit, uh, it got 7,649 net upvotes and 2,326 comments, most of which being people who liked the article or were just there to, you know, talk some smack on Star Citizen and have a laugh over the current situation of the game, etc. And then when you go to Star Citizen as a subreddit, which of course is where most of the people who are very heavily emotionally or financially invested in the project are going to congregate, the article didn't do very well because I imagine the article is critical of the project and therefore... In my own experience, when you post something on a subreddit where everyone there is a fan of said thing, they're probably not going to take too well to, to any kind of criticism, even if it is valid criticism. So I'm going to look at this article as objectively as I can, as someone who isn't invested in any kind of way in Star Citizen, and somebody who doesn't really care too much about the project other than wanting to see it succeed. Because if it did fail, that would obviously be a very bad thing for crowdfunding in general, as this is the biggest crowdfunded project ever other than some cryptocurrency games, which of course, you know, that's less about the crowdfunding and more about people trying to become rich, which isn't what we're talking about today. So let's go through the article together today. And also I want to get into Star Citizen at some point. And what do you need to get into Star Citizen? You need money to buy spaceships. So time for a word from today's sponsor. Do you want to become an ace defender? No? Well, how about now? What if this lovely lady with the gentle jiggle physics asks you to defend her during a single-player campaign that splits time between an auto-battler and a tower defense game? I know I'd be much more likely to click the link in the video description if it was a beautiful waifu asking and not me. But they did sponsor my video and not hers, so I guess I'm the winner in the end. And you can also be a winner in Ace Defender War of the Dragon Slayer. Launching with over 40 chapters to play through with nearly 2,000 levels and scoring a 4.8 out of 5 on the Google Play Store out of almost 45,000 reviews to date. Collect heroes from five different factions, Divine, Demon, Shadow, Nature or Light, with over 48 heroes to collect and new releases every two weeks. Speed up or slow down the action with a 1, 2 or 4 times game speed, with a fully solo mode of gameplay during the expedition and PvE experiences like Dungeons and Trials, or join the PvP with arenas against other players on your server or cross servers in the King's Arena. So make sure if you are interested in checking out Ace Defender and letting them know it was worthwhile to throw some coins to your MMO Watcher for this sponsored segment, click the link in the video description and advance to level 10 in the game to receive 700 diamonds, 150,000 gold, 7 royal recruit tickets, 50 purple random equipment fragments, and the legendary hero, Lipez, the sealed bulwark and thank you again to ace defender for sponsoring this video so i don't know what the actual narrative of this article is i assume it's going to be more of a critical look and you know don't buy this thing but here we go star citizen a 400 plus million dollar gaming project with no release date in sight 2021 this article is an in-depth look at the funds star citizen has raised and its controversial past to present 400 plus million dollars and 10 years of development has resulted in the alpha space game you may have heard of star citizen but should you buy it, let's find out. Now, I assume with the leading language immediately right off the jump, it's going to be a no from this uh, writer's perspective. But here we go. If you're in the market for a good space game, you may have run across Star Citizen during your search. But before you hit buy on that starter package, it's a good idea to know just what you're getting into. This article will cover how much funds Star Citizen has raised, the troubled past of Star Citizen, insane ship prices and FOMO, fear of missing out practices employed by CIG, and the controversy surrounding Star Citizen and Squadron 42. So obviously I'm going to try and look at this as unbiased as possible. So if they're going to present mostly the negatives, I might as well present the positives. Uh, if you are buying into Star Citizen, there's a community of tens of thousands of people who were playing what is already out in terms of the alpha and having a lot of fun doing it and saying that they're you know getting their money's worth. So whenever you fund anything, whether it's an early access game or a Kickstarter, if it has something already playable, then you obviously have like a middle ground of where you've put money in and you want a finished product, but you might have already been getting your money's worth and not be worried about, you know, what happens in the future based on what you've already experienced. So there is obviously people that have paid into this that enjoy what the game currently is. And then, of course, hope that there's more to come in the future that would compound on, on their enjoyment of their initial, you know, investment, as people like to call it. So alpha after 10 years and 400 plus million. 
If this isn't your first time hearing about Star Citizen, then you likely know a lot about its troubled history of development. Helmed by Chris Roberts, development originally started in 2011, with the Kickstarter first launching in 2012. It smashed through its funding goals, raising a total of $2.1 million. However, funding didn't stop there. They continued adding stretch goals with each funding milestone they passed until they reached the 65 million milestone. Fast forward to today, and they've managed to raise over 380 million in crowd funds alone, with the extra Calder's investment of 46 million that puts the total funds the project has amassed to over 400 million dollars. It, it feels like forever since it's nine years ago now that the Kickstarter came up and 2.1 million. What would have happened if they only raised 2.1 million? And then nobody kept funding the game is always my question with stuff like this. Like, did they know that it was going to require so much? And of course, some people say that the game was different back then and that the scope of the game was much smaller and they started, you know, increasing the scope as things went on. But would they have released the game by now? Would it have been finished? Uh, a, a complete vision and product that they said it was going to be in the Kickstarter if people just gave in them that 2.1 million and didn't go above and beyond to the point where we're now at over 400 million. It's a food for thought, but obviously something nobody knows. So a never-ending tale of missed deadlines and setbacks, Star Citizen's development has a long and troubled history. With development starting in 2011 and the first release date set for 2014, it's likely no one thought that it would still be in alpha state seven years after the first missed deadline and 400 plus million. Back in October of 2012, Chris Roberts did an exclusive interview for the Mitani. Uh, in it, he was asked if the game could really be done given its size and scope, to which he replied, We're already one year in. Another two years puts us at three total, which is ideal. Any more and things will begin to get stale. So this is direct from him, and there's a, the, a backup source link here for the interview. Chris Roberts seemed confident at the time that it would only take two to three years, but nine years since the kickstart on the project is still nowhere near finished this is something that you will see in a lot of crowdfunding projects like i cover them for a job uh, all the all the kickstarter crowdfunded mmos and things like that they almost always say oh we increased the scope and scale of what we were doing and that's why you know we ran out of money or or it doesn't look like we've done as much as what we potentially should have been doing and to me it's always been a, a better idea to deliver the core vision of the game and then expand around that once you've got a viable product that people can buy and play and that delivers on what you promised people originally because after that you do start getting into murky waters of you made a promise that something was going to happen and then you didn't deliver on it and then that continues to compound over and over again the more you do that and the more dates you miss which has been star citizen in a nutshell unfortunately so freelancer versus star citizen the past repeated star citizen is touted as being a spiritual successor to freelancer one of my friends is obsessed with this game it's like his entire childhood he loves it i never played it personally a game that was also originally planned by Chris Roberts. But not everything goes according to plan, and after being hit with delays, Microsoft bought out Digital Anvil, the studio behind Freelancer. Roberts remained as a consultant on Freelancer, but Microsoft proceeded to cut out a lot of the overambitious features while trying to adhere to Roberts' vision. It was finally released in 2003, six years after work had begun, and well after its intended release date. So this is obviously building on the narrative that you must have seen if you follow Star Citizen of Chris Roberts essentially gets in charge of something and then can't finish it. He can't release it because he keeps adding more and more and trying to, you know, be a perfectionist and going above and beyond trying to add as many features as he possibly can. Even back in early 2000s, people noted how long Freelancer had been taking. In an article on GameSpot, Amir Ajani notes that it's been in development longer than most every other PC game. In that same vein, Star Citizen is on track to breaking the record for the longest non-released game in active development. I figured as much, I figured that would be the case. Many backers are expecting the game to take at least 5 to 10 more years, which would surpass the development time frame of Duke Nukem Forever. That's mad, I didn't even know Duke Nukem Forever took that long. But since it's called Duke Nukem Forever, that does make sense. In his original pitch video, Chris Roberts mentioned how 10 years ago we got burned out on making video games. Taking a look at his LinkedIn profile reveals that since January of 2001, until the creation of Cloud Imperium Games, he was not involved in the gaming industry at all. He was working as CEO of the film company Ascendant Pictures, followed by working as Chief Creative Officer for Blink Media International. Star Citizen was going to be his comeback to the gaming industry, however, as he was not just going to build a video game, but a universe, something he's always wanted to create. However, he wanted to fund it via crowdfunding. Of course, why risk other people or your own money? when you could risk the publics. Uh, one of the things I like about crowdfunding is cutting out the politics and the noise of the big publisher, says Chris Roberts in the pitch video. 
makes sense. While it's true that crowdfunding is a great way to fund a project, it also comes with a significant amount of risk for those who choose to back certain projects. Kickstarter projects often fail, leaving backers with little to no recourse of getting their money back. In Star Citizen's case, with no publisher oversight, he's amassed a significant amount of money and overambitious stretch goals that will likely not be in the game for years, if at all. So this, of course, immediately comes back to what I was talking about earlier. Uh, at the moment, the game is playable with bugs, of course, with the performance not being amazing. But there are a lot of people that have already got their money's worth and would be fine if it went tits up compared to some other Kickstarter MMOs like, say, Chronicles of Valyria that never delivered on anything. But of course, Chronicles of Valyria raised $8 million and this has raised 440. So there's a difference there in, in you know, I'm sure if, if you gave Caspian from Chronicles of Valyria and Soulbound Studios $400 million, he probably would have delivered something as well. So it always kind of uh, weirds me out a little bit when this is a defense point from, from people who defend Star Citizen vehemently, where they'll say, oh, you know, they are delivering an experience already. And y you would have to say, yeah, of course they are. It's been a decade and $400 million, and they're spending money extremely quickly. I think one of the Star Citizen aficionados will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember reading an article, or it might have been the financial report from Star Citizen itself, saying that they use a ton of money every year and therefore if i think it was something like a year if they stopped getting crowdfunding just one day people were just like oh we're not going to fund this anymore because we, we've lost faith if they stopped getting crowdfunding i think they'd be out of money within a year or something like that which is kind of worrying if i was heavily invested in this game i'd be worried about that but i, I don't see people not continuing putting money in this because the sunk cost fallacy is way too big and obviously people are really invested in this idea of star citizen understandably because it's a, a, an amazing game on paper and already what they've got to show looks really good is it worth 400 million dollars so far probably not but you know your, your mileage is going to vary on that depending on your perspective so star citizen scope increase why is star citizen taking so long when asking this question in a common answer is that the majority of the community voted for an increase in the scope of the game, once Star Citizen reached certain funding milestones, various polls were released asking backers how funding should continue. They were released at the 19 million and 40 million milestones respectively. So what should we do with crowdfunding counter after we reach our goal? Take the funds raised counter down to 23 million, mission achieved, 5% voted on this. Have the funding counter display the amount towards the current stretch goal slash feature, not the total amount once we reach 23 million, 7% voted on this. Or C, that 88% voted on, keep it up through development and continue to offer stretch goal rewards in addition to extra features and development milestones. So 88% of people voted that this is what they should do after 19 million was raised. And then next up, after 46 million was raised, they said, should we continue to offer stretch goals? Yes, no, or no preference. Yes, got 55. No, got, I think that's a 26, but that wouldn't make sense. And, and C, for no preference, got 20. While the polls seem to indicate the majority of backers wanted to increase in scope as of November 19th, 2012, the year before the first poll was released, the Kickstarter had gained support from 34,397 backers, but by September 2014, Star Citizen had about 534,000 backers, three months after the $46 million poll was released. This means that the majority of the community did not actively vote for the increase in scope. So there's obviously a massive issue here, and I think if you look at this objectively, everyone can understand that there are actually hundreds of thousands of people here that put money into something that can have a legit grievance that this has happened. Because even if you look at the voter numbers, 55% voted yes, continue, and that means 45% voted either no preference or no. So if you took those numbers as a percentage and applied that to the whole 500,000 backers at this time, you would have hundreds of thousands of people that were like, no, we just want the game we paid you for. And then obviously you've got the majority saying yes, continue with it. But at the same time, of those people, how many people wouldn't have understood that it would be another seven years and still be an alpha? Would they have still made that decision back then, having known that seven years later you still wouldn't have even a remotely close to finished product? It just seems if at this point you say, you know, I'm a fan of Star Citizen and, and you know, this is wrong, you are dismissing the, the opinions of people who helped fund the game to get to the stage that is currently at who had the same faith in the project and vision and wanted to be part of the same thing as you back then. Overall, I just think it's a really bad situation to be in because it, Star Citizen is such a divisive experience. It's such a controversial topic to talk about because you have the people 
who really, really love this project and are really invested in it. And then you have people that feel spurned, that feel, you know, some form of hatred or, or mistrust or heavy dislike for everyone involved in Star Citizen and the community. Because what you've got to imagine is when they got to the point where they were like, I just want the game I paid for. And they turned to the community and said, you know, this isn't right. I paid for this and I've not been given it. The community probably wasn't very kind to them at that point. And then people go on and harbor that grievance uh, going forward. And it creates this situation where it's like an us versus them and, and people have like a really negative energy around it. And it's in both sides. It's in defenders of the game and people who maybe at one point were a defender of the game or a believer and they've now moved on. And it's just, it's it's a really shitty situation overall, I think. It's, it's not good for anybody. So next up, the scope before and after. Even though increased scope is often the scapegoat as to why the game hasn't been finished yet, is that really the problem? With the most recent addition of the localized Orison to the game, Star Citizen finally has one finished system. That said, it is far from optimized and it is full of game-breaking bugs. Most backers report that you need at least 32 gig of memory to run the game smoothly. That said, let's take a look at the $6 million stretch goal from their campaign. Their $6 million stretch goal was 100 star systems on launch. This stretch goal was passed on November 18th, 2012, well before the scope increased via additional stretch goals. But it has taken nine years since then and 400 plus million for one complete star system, missing the majority of its gameplay features. I mean, that is a pretty damning indictment of, uh, of over-promising and under-delivering. There's nothing really I can say to play devil's advocate on this one that does look bad you promise for six mil that you'd have 100 star systems and at that time you were also promising the game's going to be done in a couple of years and nine years later and orders of magnitude more funding you've done one and that's not even 100 percent done that doesn't look good even if you include squadron 42 in the total development budget that's still at least 200 million a piece half towards star citizen and half towards squadron 42. it is also important to remember that both games share assets here are some other stretch goals, keeping in mind that all of these were already stretch goals well before the polls were released. So at the $4 million stretch goal, we see that an additional system will be added for every $100,000 pledged. Players will also be given professional mod tools. This is a mod manual you can purchase on the RSI store right now on how to mod private servers despite both the tools and servers not in the game. It doesn't even have a picture associated with it. So wait, they're selling a manual that doesn't exist yet. This is a pre-order and won't be available until closer to game launch. How long have they been selling that for? Can somebody tell me how, how long have they been selling the modding manual uh, on the RSI store? That's, that's a little bit weird. Like, I don't honestly know why anyone would buy this, especially before it exists, because surely they're not going to run out of the mod manuals. Why would you need to pre-order it? You know, it's just a little bit of a weird thing for me, but there we go. We are already seeing an impressive amount of very ambitious features being added to the campaign. At the $4 million stretch goal, at the $10 million stretch goal, we see the addition of a mocap studio. So Cloud Imperium Games will build their own mocap studio to improve the quality of Star Citizen and Squadron 42's cutscenes. Squadron 42 has an original cast of A-list actors. They include the likes of Gary Oldman and Mark Hamill. In 2008, Gary Oldman earned a $3 million salary for his role of James Gordon in the movie The Dark Knight. In The Force Awakens, Mark Hamill was paid between one to three million where all he did was stand and take off his hood as reported by The Things. I mean, he's definitely winning on that one, right? He was hardly in that movie and, and you know, that movie wasn't very good to be honest. Please don't hate me. In addition to high actor costs, running a mocap studio isn't cheap. A single Rococo suit costs $2,500 and that's supposed to be on a budget. According to Cloud Imperium Games, a single day of motion capture costs between twenty-five dollars and $50,000 and provides roughly 200 moves, simple gestures, limb movements, and so on, according to Chris Roberts on the RSI forums, which is also sourced. Keep in mind this was for the $10 million stretch goal as well, and does not include development costs nor the nine other actors that make up the main crew. It can't have been cheap to get these people to do this. I mean, it, if the, the game does come out and those people are in it, that's probably pretty awesome to me this is star citizen in a nutshell like this concept if you look at this under a microscope is just star citizen uh they could have just got normal voice actors to do this and then once the game was released and and bringing in money for being this revolutionary amazing gaming experience they could have used that money to then add characters into the story that are played by gary oldman or mark hamill the answer seems pretty clear that the alleged increase in scope is not the reason star citizen and squadron 42 have taken this long the scope was already massive before funding 
had even reached 10 million. Years later, there's only one unoptimized system in place, missing many features and core tech that would greatly help realize Chris Roberts' vision. The stretch goals continue up until the $65 million funding milestone, the majority of which haven't been implemented into the game. In spite of that, thanks to concept sales of ships, among other things, funding has continued to soar. What I'm expecting from this video is that by this point already, a lot of the Star Citizen fans will have already left a dislike on the video and a comment talking about how I don't know what I'm talking about, even though it's not me writing the article, I'm just relaying the information and giving my opinion here and there. But I don't know how you argue against this. This seems pretty solid, in my opinion. Uh, the argument, like I said earlier in the video, before we got to this point, has always been the reason Star Citizen is not out yet is because of this scope increase. But if at $10 million, they were saying, you know, it's a couple years and 10 mil and we'll have all of these things. And then $400 million later and seven years, you only have a fraction of those things. How can it be the scope that people voted for that was on those stretch goals? Because they're long since gone already, long since funded. Uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I understand why people defend it. It's one sunk cost fallacy and two, because the idea of if you didn't defend it, people would stop funding the game and the game goes under and you don't get delivered this experience. It makes complete sense, right? You, you don't want people all just bad mouthing the game and memeing it into death. If everyone turned around and started saying, yeah, we're not happy with this. This is not ideal. This is really bad. And that's all you saw on Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, etc., etc then that's not going to bode well for the game. It's going to stop getting funding. And like I said earlier, they've already scaled up to the point where they need that money to continue. So that would be ostensibly the death of the Star Citizen development and they'd have to release as is, which is obviously not going to go very well. But at the same time, I'm interested to see when people do react to this portion of the video, what exactly is wrong here? Why was this article completely dismissed? Because it seems while he is presenting the negatives... Uh, of course he is, that's the point of the article, and I don't see where the counter is to this, to be honest, but let's continue. Ship prices and FOMO practices employed by CIG. If you thought microtransactions that nickel and dime you at every chance they get were bad, wait until you see CIG's revolutionary macrotransaction setup. In fact, it's so revolutionary that the editor being used to write this article thinks the word is misspelled. So obviously he's using macro there instead of micro because there's nothing micro about paying a couple thousand dollars for a ship, to be honest. That isn't a microtransaction. So let's take a look at CIG's insane ship prices that you can pledge, not purchase to support development of Star Citizen. And it has, of course, come out recently that the Advertising Standards Agency has been in touch with CIG and told them, you need to make it clearer that people are buying concepts here and not an actual product because these things don't exist. So people are paying for things and it's not super clear that they're not actually getting it because it, it's not been made yet. And, and you know, whether things go badly or not may never get made. You know, that's the risk you run in. I don't think that's super likely, but it's not off the table either. So the Javelin is $3,000, concept price is $2,500. So you get a $500 discount if you buy it uh, before before it comes out. Kraken Privateer is 2000 and 2000 The Kraken standalone price, 1650 price, 1650 the Idris P, Idris P standalone price 1500, 1250, Idris M standalone price 1000, concept price 1000. As of writing this article, none of these ships are able to be spawned by players into the game. There is a mission that involves an Idris in the game, but there is no interior. Of course, all you need to do in order to play the game is pledge a $45 starter package, and many ships are purchasable with in-game credits if you're willing to grind in order to get them. That said, a lot of the ships that have been released into the game aren't able to be utilized to their full extent. For example, the Carrick, a $600 ship that is purchasable with in-game credits, is an exploration ship, but many players are still waiting for meaningful exploration gameplay. While Star Citizen does have some gameplay loops implemented, they are primary bare-bones versions of what they are supposed to be. A recent thread on the Star Citizen subreddit asked what gameplay loops backers would want if it could be 100% completed, Many backers asked for exploration, others wanted trading and mining, some added they just didn't want certain bugs slash desync in the game. The most desired, fully completed feature backers wanted was trading, followed by the other category which includes racing, piracy and exploration. Based on the responses from that thread, it's safe to say a significant portion of those who voted other, third place goes to salvage, a feature that has been constantly pushed back on the roadmap. With only one system in the game and many gameplay features missing, the majority of ships are empty shells of what they could be. However, CIG continues to sell ships and vehicles that are not in the game as a means to continue funding development. There is even a Legatus pack you can pledge that costs an astounding total of $35,000. Okay. 
yeah, that is absolutely crazy. So for more information on ship pricing, you can find a comprehensive list here. I would rather not personally. I think that was enough for me. So now he goes into detail, standalone prices versus concept prices and FOMO, fear of missing out. You may have noticed while browsing ship prices that there are standalone prices and concept prices. In addition to those, there are war bond prices as well. Okay, what's that one? This reflects a FOMO tactic used by CIG to entice backers to buy ships at a cheaper price. Buying a ship at its concept price in most cases means you will get it cheaper than when the ship is released in the game. Though some prices remain the same, many increase in price. As you can see with the Javelin, the concept price was $2,500 while the standalone is $3,000. While it is true that you can buy a starter package at $45 price point, CIG is well known for aggressive marketing techniques. During concept sales, the company will put a limit on how many digital assets are available to pledge as a means to generate artificial scarcity. Here is an example of one of their marketing emails. So here we go, don't miss your chance to pledge for the RSI Scorpius Crusader Hercules Starlifter and Tumbril Nova. These ships will be leaving the pledge store on Wednesday, June 23rd, so act fast before they depart in 48 hours. The ships listed cost $220, $400, and $120 respectively. Right now, there are 162 ships in Star Citizen, with 111 of them being fly ready, though not necessarily feature complete. That's actually more ships being ready than what I thought, and I assume it's some of the bigger ones that are going to be not finished yet, which would make complete sense. Uh, but yeah, that, that is more than I thought was going to be complete. I thought it was going to be much, much less than that. Now, obviously, Devil's Advocate here, pre-ordering things has existed for a very long time. And usually if you pre-order something, you're either going to get some perks or a reduced price, right? That That's very common knowledge that exists in most industries. That being said, there is an additional element to this that makes it worse and likely why he's bringing this up. And that is because obviously... The, the entire game's not done. If the game was finished and you were doing a pre-order on a ship that just wasn't in the game yet and, you know, the, everything else was done, I don't think anyone would have a problem with this. But when you combine that you're pre-ordering something that isn't in the game, that is in a game that isn't even remotely close to being done, that obviously is the additional layer that makes this worse and likely why he's bringing it up as a point and not because he doesn't understand the concept of pre-ordering things, giving you a, a reduced price, which is... Like I say, it's prevalent in, in pretty much every industry. Star Citizen and Squadron 42's controversy. So in parallel with Star Citizen and Squadron 42's troubled development, the project has garnered a lot of controversy over the years. In 2015, Chris Roberts is quoted as saying, by the end of this year, backers will have everything they originally pledged for, plus a lot more. Uh, that didn't happen, of course. This was supposed to include the single-player campaign, Squadron 42, along with a very early alpha of the persistent universe by the end of the year. At bare minimum, they plan to have trading, mining, piracy, combat, as well as other core features developed by then. However, as of right now, Squadron 42 has no release date, and the most fleshed-out feature in Star Citizen is arguably mining. Again, another, another thing that I don't really see how anyone defending this could have a counter to this. Like, what is the... What is the line of logic that people defending this are using to say, oh, that's not right, that's that's biased, that's too negative? I am honestly interested as well because I don't have a dog in this race. I don't cover Star Citizen. I don't get views from Star Citizen. I'm not backing the game. Uh, I have no interest in seeing the game fail because, like I said at the beginning of the video, that is bad for everyone. If a $400 plus million dollar game just fails and vanishes, that is seismic ripples through the industry, specifically with crowdfunding, and I am an advocate for crowdfunding and for early access models. I play early access and crowdfunded games more than I do AAA games. So I have no biases against it. I, 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 you know, they've not done anything to me. Chris Roberts has not came around and kicked my dog. So I have no issues with it whatsoever uh, before people start calling me bias, which will probably happen. Uh, I, I just don't understand the logic behind how could anybody defend what has happened from then to now? Or is that a straw man? Do people even defend this or do they acknowledge this and just say it's not ideal, but I am still having faith in the project? Maybe that is the case. So where is Squadron 42? On their previous roadmap, CIG was supposed to have Squadron 42 enter beta by the end of 2020, but that changed when Q3 of that year came and went with no indication the game had entered beta. In a response on Spectrum in October of 2020, Chris Roberts said, quote, Squadron 42 will be done when it is done and that it will not be released just to make a date. Understandable. In his reply, Roberts pointed out Red Dead Redemption 2, The Last of Us 2 and Cyberpunk 2077 as examples of games that had taken longer than planned. Granted, they also weren't in an alpha state after 10 years or selling ships for thousands of dollars that weren't in their games yet. I mean, he's not wrong. I, I can't argue with the logic. He's not wrong. It, it is a low blow. And at the same time, 
Chris Roberts also has a point. He's on shaky ground, but games should release when they're done and when they're actually ready to be played and, and feature complete, as opposed to releasing just because they, they have to hit a date that they said. Cyberpunk 2077 is actually a perfect example of this. It needed more time. It released to meet a date. And look at how that turned out. Not as well as it should have done. So then we get to a roadmap to a roadmap. In an attempt to maintain transparency with their backers, Cloud Imperium Games released a roadmap to a roadmap. One, give an explanation of the goals of our new roadmap and what to expect from it. Two, show a rough mock-up of the proposed new roadmap. Three, share a work in progress version of the roadmap for at least one of our core teams. Four, and then finally transition to this new roadmap. Tyler Witkin, Spectrum, July 2020. This news hit the internet by storm, I'm sure it did. The company was criticised by backers for not communicating the status of Squadron 42 until massively OP and Kotaku had published articles regarding the issues. Tyler Witkin, whose handle is ZyloCIG on Spectrum, claimed that no one reacted because of an article as it's not where we place value. Interestingly enough, Tyler Witkin also supposedly played through all of Squadron 42 missions back in 2016. And as a quote here, question, have you been able to play through a single mission of Squadron 42 yet? And he responds, I have played through every mission because I come from QA and it was my job to do so. So we continue the article, Squadron 42 was apparently playable enough to get through every mission back in 2016, yet as of August's update report, the entire first half of chapter 05 is just now playable from start to finish. Quote, it has been great to see all this work pay off as the entire first half of chapter 5 is now playable from start to finish. This was no easy feat, as there were a lot of animations, two walk and talk sequences, and plenty of technical challenges involved. This is from the gameplay story team. So Squadron 42 is supposed to be a trilogy. Last year, CIG released an update video regarding this single player franchise. It primarily showed the developers walking through an empty space station, theory crafting about what you could potentially do, and then showed some basic interactions with NPCs. Quote here from Ross, Something you could do, or the AI could do, is you could come over to one of these consoles and interact with some of the screens and basically, like, get access to these server racks. And you could actually interact with them and then kind of have them lower into the floor. Oh, riveting. That's sick. Uh, in their series called Squadron 42, The Briefing Room, Ross goes over things you could possibly do in the event you were in a room with enemies. But rather than show any actual gameplay, the discussion revolves around the idea of what a player would be able to do. After 10 years and 400 plus million, it seems a long-awaited single-player game is still a long ways off, and this is just for episode 1. So he keeps hammering home this point of 10 years and 400 million dollars uh, repeatedly in the article, like every section is, oh, 10 years, 400 mil, 10 years, 400 mil. Which, again, is not wrong, but I don't think it adds anything here. Like, we know at this point that that's, that's going on, and it just seems like this is something that's going to get people more riled up than, than needs to be. So regarding the actual section, talking about the playable missions and things like that, and the guy saying, oh, I played through all of them back in 2016, that doesn't necessarily have to be wrong, because as we've already proven throughout this article, they just increase scope ridiculously. And at the same time, maybe they had the bare bones of the quests back then, but it doesn't bode well when they say, oh, this chapter is now complete, but we can't show it to you uh, five years after, uh, allegedly, this guy could play through all of them. That obviously doesn't look good, but there you go. Physical products from the Kickstarter are still not delivered. Various physical products from the original Kickstarter have not been delivered to backers. Here is a list of them excluding rewards that are duplicated at each tier. If this is true, this is particularly egregious. If you've not delivered a spaceship-shaped USB and things like that after nine years of, of taking people's money that's bad. So I'm not sure if this article is about to tell me, but somebody in the comments would have to let me know or link me to a source. Has anyone from CIG said anything about this and why they've not delivered them or how much of this has been delivered and things like that? Because that to me is is probably worse than not delivering on the game because the game, you know, is, is really hard to make and these other things are just like, how could you not have delivered those in, in this much time after taking money from people? So while CIG has stated that most of these items will be shipped when the game is complete, oh, there you go, I guess. By this point, the CD soundtrack is outdated, given that CDs are rarely used nowadays on PCs, beyond installing operating systems and certain software. That's true, I don't have a CD drive in my computer, I haven't for about five years. I'll give you guys a funny vision to put in your mind. It's 2030, Star Citizen has just released, and you've opened up your, your package from Kickstarter. Oh, it's a CD from Star Citizen, let me just bang that in my Sony Walkman. So I can walk around with my over ear, ear uh, headphones on. You know, the ones that looked like uh, the, the original Xbox headsets? Yeah, those. And you're going to walk around blasting your Star Citizen uh, music on your CD player. That's fucking funny, bro. 
So despite the fact these physical goods have never shipped, CRG sells physical merchandise on their store, ranging from ship ornaments to Pico plushies. Yeah, that's that's pretty bad. I'd feel pretty hard done to if I was a Kickstarter backer. So the perspective I always like to look at things like this from is that of being thankful for what people have done for you, right? That's like a, a normal human emotion and, and something that I think everyone should be able to understand. Chris Roberts came into this with a dream and he said, I've got this dream. This is my dream, my dream game. And I'm going to pay myself a good salary and set myself up for the future based on you guys. You guys are going to give me money and I'm going to, you know, have my dream come true and, and work on my dream project where I'm in charge of everything. No publishers are involved or anything. I get the final say and I can finally do what I always wanted to do, build a universe. And then the people who originally helped you realize that dream and got your foot on the ladder, you're not going to deliver them what, what they paid for just purely on a technicality of maybe it says when the game launches, you'll get these things, but then you're going to sell other people things later on down the line, physical objects and deliver those. Morally, I think that's wrong. I think legally, maybe they're fine on, if on Kickstarter it says they're not going to deliver them until the release of the game, then the game's not been released and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think morally, uh, I'd have a problem with that personally. Uh, that's just me. So while some players have reported receiving models, it is unclear whether those models were from the Kickstarter or purchased via the store. So this shouldn't be in the article then, based on that. If you can't confirm that people haven't received these, and I've just went on a tangent about it, don't put it in the article. That just discredits what you've already done. Uh, this is the first thing you've not linked a source for, and I, I'd just remove this if you can't source it, if you can't know whether or not they've delivered them. It has absolutely no place in an article that is trying to be objective. So there you go. CRG has on occasion sold models such as the Constellation on its store for $125. Additionally, the higher tiers offered video conferences and even meeting Chris Roberts and key developers in person, but those have not been included as the physical products. CRG has since invited people to their studio multiple times, probably content creators and stuff like that, drum up marketing. But yeah, same thing as I said before, if you're capable of inviting other people, you should probably have invited the people who gave you that start to your dream. Uh, I think that's pretty objectively fair. While it's typically not a problem for a company to not ship physical products to backers until the project is complete, is it okay for a company to sell physical products on their store when they haven't even delivered the physical merchandise from the original Kickstarter? What do you think? Obviously loaded question, loaded way to, to present that. I agree with the premise, if it's true. Uh, but you've not linked a source here and, and you've just said, you know, it's unclear whether the models were from, from the Kickstarter or purchased via the store. I imagine not everything's been delivered, uh, especially if it literally states they won't be delivered till the game's done. And I have a problem with that. But at the same time, it, it, this does weaken the, the objectivity of the article, uh, which obviously already is coming at this from a negative bias. So I can start to understand a little bit as to why some of the people in the Star Citizen fan base were not receptive to this. But of course, most of the things he's brought up so far are not, you know, negative for the sake of being negative. They're negative because the actual thing is ostensibly negative. The court of public opinion, the controversy surrounding Star Citizen and Squadron 42 stretches back years. CIG has been sued by both companies and players. Crytek sued CIG for copyright infringement, a case which was ultimately settled out of court. And a backer sued CIG for $4,500 refund, but lost. I'm gonna have to read into that one day. Uh, while legally the courts seem to side with Cloud Imperium games, the court of public opinion is harder to convince. Star Citizen has been called an outright scam by many, while others often make the joke that money laundering is involved. The majority seem to think it's simply mismanagement and underestimation about how long it would take to get certain things done. But is it really a scam, mismanagement or simple ambition? Let's be honest, at the very least, it's not money laundering. If you want a good, fairly hilarious and neutral outlook on the project, have a look at TechLinked's video, where they approach the project from both sides of the coin. However, they've said some arguably questionable things. So here is a quote on screen from Riley Murdoch. I've not watched this video just as a disclaimer, so I'm going to have to take this at face value. Quote, some people call Star Citizen a scam, and I don't think that is accurate. Even Butcher said it's not a scam, but the fact is people have been scammed by it. Okay, we'll unpack that in a second. So article continues. How can people not be a scam and yet people be scammed by it? You can't get scammed by something that's not a scam. Uh, okay, we're, we're going to have to unpack this. In this segment, Murdoch says that Star Citizen wasn't presented as an ongoing alpha project, but that it was constantly portrayed as something that was two years from release. He, quote, blames Chris Roberts and CIG for constantly acting like the game would be, quote, released within the next couple of years. And frankly, 
he's right. The game always seems to be two years away. It's actually become a meme at this point within the community. CRG is constantly putting the carrot in front of the horse, only to end up releasing a feature in a literal tier zero state. This has often caused friction within the community, and as a result caused people to lose faith in the project. Okay, so let's unpack this idea of it being a scam or not a scam and people still being scammed by it. Now, the guy writing the article seems to think you cannot get scammed by something that isn't a scam. But if you look at the legal definition, and we have to assume that they are using the legal definition because they didn't give any other presentation of it, or at least the article didn't show it, if they're using the legal definition of it, a scam is, quote, making a false representation and dishonesty, knowing that the representation was or might be untrue or misleading. Now, for you to say that Star Citizen is a scam using the legal definition, you would have to be able to prove intent from Chris Roberts, which means you have to either crawl into his mind, Vulcan mind meld that motherfucker, or get him on tape saying, yeah, I knew I couldn't release the game for multiple years, uh, and I just sold people on that idea anyway to take their money. In which case, then you have intent to scam people, to defraud people, to take money from people based on things he knew he couldn't do. But if it's just mismanagement, incompetence, and things like that, I've made this distinction and had this conversation multiple times in my own videos. You can start out completely well-intentioned and say you're going to be able to deliver these things and just not know. And therefore, you're not actually scamming people, but the result of people buying into your idea that cannot be fulfilled in the time frame that you've said and in the way that you've said, they are being scammed, but there is no intent to scam them, or at least you cannot prove that intent. If you could, you would win a court case. If you could prove that they intended to scam people, then you would win in court, but you can't because you can't prove their intent was to do that unless you have some kind of recording or like I say, you can get inside his mind. People throw the word scam around all the time, a lot of the time because they either don't understand what a scam is and that it has a legal definition and then don't outline what they mean by scam if they're using the word for, you know, some kind of impact and to grab headlines and to, you know, shock people into things, which I use sometimes as well. I use the word scam because I do believe if you are running a project that will fail because all the fundamentals are completely wrong and you seem like a dreamer or you're completely out of your depth you might not intend to scam people but the end result is exactly the same you are selling people on something that you cannot deliver whether that's by being intentionally malicious or dishonest or by incompetence you are scamming people you are just not an actual scam by the legal standards Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, maybe it won't for some people, and obviously everyone can have their own opinion on this. That's just mine. But I do understand what he means by people being scammed by it, but it isn't a scam because they have a product. You can buy the product, and you can fly around in it and do whatever's available in Star Citizen already. So, yeah, there you go. So no refunds after 30 days, the grey market. From actual refunds to the subreddit Star Citizen refunds, finding a way to recoup losses is a common theme when it comes to Star Citizen. After years of waiting, many backers decide they want out, but now you cannot get refunds after 30 days time window of purchasing the game. The only recourse a player has is to go through the grey market. The grey market is where a backer can sell their ships to other players in an attempt to get back their money. This is a win-win for both the backer and CIG, as the backer gets back some of their money and CIG loses none. In some cases, a backer may even get more money if they are selling the ships that they bought at the concept price which if you remember earlier was when you bought them early before they were actually made and put in the game, you got them for cheaper sometimes. There are actually multiple sites where you can get ships. You have Star Hangar and Space Foundry that will help players either buy or sell ships. It's important to note, however, that it's easy to get scammed selling things on the grey market in general. Always know who you are dealing with when going through the grey market. Of course, same with anything. Real money trading, real money economy exists in pretty much every online game ever. People selling accounts, selling boosts, selling currency uh, or items. The refund subreddit can also be a helpful resource when it comes to the grey market. There are users that often help those wanting to sell their ships and recoup what they have spent on the game. The community is also responsible for the album of quotes created by user Quavers and Watsits, Watsits are my preference to be honest, that sources various quotes from CIG, some of which are featured in this article. Now I actually think it's kind of funny that there's a lot of games that kind of emulate in Star Citizen at this point on the blockchain and using NFTs. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that if Star Citizen was announced in 2021 and not in 2012, they probably would have done it with NFTs and on the blockchain, and it would have made sense for the project and what they're trying to do. But in an alternate universe as a thought experiment, I think that probably would have happened, solved some problems, made some problems worse. So then he ends the article. This is the last one. This has been a very long video. Should you get Star Citizen? 
whether or not Star Citizen is a game you should get is up to you. So it doesn't really answer the question. Just use that as a tagline to drag people into the article, which is totally fine. Clickbait is, is you know, required on the internet. If you're not clickbaiting somebody else's and you're doing a fucking disservice to yourself and your content, are you comfortable with backing a game that is still an alpha with a lot of bugs? Are you okay with supporting a project that has been delayed many times with the director saying he is unwilling to compromise? I mean, if you ask those questions, most people are going to say probably not but we will present a differing viewpoint in a minute. It's been 10 years since development started, nine since the Kickstarter, and 400 plus million. How much longer will be needed to develop the project? Chris Roberts seems to have the answer. And here's a quote from Chris Roberts from September 2020 on the RSI forums. Quote, Pretty impressive for a game in an early alpha state. I can promise you the gameplay I described is not a pipe dream, nor will it take 10 to 20 years to deliver. Pretty interesting quote. Uh, it's already taken 10 years, so, you know, there you go. He's obviously talking about not taking 10, year, 10 to 20 years from now in September 2020, which hopefully not, because holy shit, uh, by that point, it probably would be super out of date anyway, so there you go. And then he ends the article by saying there's a free fly going on right now where you can give the game a shot and make the decision yourself without paying a dime. Very good idea. If you're going to get into Star Citizen, do so on the free fly uh, where you can test the ships out and things like that and get to know what is already in the game and what you're going to be getting yourself into. Who knows, maybe you will have an unforgettable experience. True. Uh, crowdfunding is basically the wild west of gaming it's, it's the american dream of the virtual world but will you find milk and honey along with streets paved with gold with high risk comes great reward however just remember to use common sense and never spend more than you are willing to lose i would say even if star citizen is an amazing game so long as you can still buy the ships and they're not limited time there's no fucking point buying them at this point you might as well just wait until the game's finished and then buy them unless you're buying to experience what the game is right now in which case go wild and I'll end the video basically mirroring that. Obviously, his should you get Star Citizen is very negatively leaning because that was the basis of the article to present all the bad things. And it doesn't present a single good thing about the game from start to finish. I've got a lot of friends and a lot of people on my Discord server that are very invested into the idea, either emotion emotionally, financially or mentally into Star Citizen. And most of them can agree it's not in an ideal state and the game could be better and it's not super acceptable that they're this long into development and this much over budget and this is what they've got to show for it but at the same time if you're buying in like a small package and you enjoy the idea of what star citizen is you can probably get more than your money's worth think of it like buying into early access at this point the game might never get finished uh, in which case you're going to be out however much you spend but if you look at what the game currently is and you think that's worth my 45 dollars or whatever to jump in or whatever price tag you put on it as your initial you know investment into getting into the game if you look at it and think it's worth it right now you're not getting scammed you know you're going to get an experience which hopefully you'll enjoy and then if you get anything else extra down the line which you most likely will do that's just all gravy at least you're not one of the people who bought in in 2012 and then you probably most likely would have had a more sour taste in your mouth to this point you're getting in fresh and maybe you can enjoy what the game has for now which to be fair has come along leaps and bounds not as much as i would hoped it would have done for the amount of money and time but they do have a game that looks stunning and has features that are are pretty crazy and epic in my opinion so there you go this is the article star citizen a 400 plus million dollar gaming project with no release date in sight Posted in 2021, August 19th, by Tech in Gaming. And I think it was a very good article, although obviously very negatively leaning. And that was the purpose. But there you go. I enjoyed it. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And hopefully I'll see you on the next one. Appreciate you all. Stay safe. Are there we out? Peace.